Good evening, this is Pastor Dominique from Ibanda Revival Center. It is such a privilege and an, uh, a great honor to come to you and to share the Word of God with you. Tonight I'm in the book of Genesis and I'm going to be reading from chapter 13 verse 14 to verse 18. Genesis chapter 13 verse 14 to 18. Now before I start I want to thank you for taking the time to watch the sermon, listen to the sermon, however Thank you so much. I want to make it worth your while and I want to make sure that you've got something that you can take away and apply to your daily living. So we're going to go and look at a story about Abraham. In fact, when we are introduced to Abraham in this passage of scripture, he's not known as Abraham, but it's Abraham. So uh, for for the purpose of the story, I'm going to refer to him throughout the scripture as Abraham, except when I read the story. But listen to what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 13, verse 14 to 18. And welcome to all of you that are online listening right now. And thank you to all of you that are listening via Spotify or YouTube. I appreciate it so much. Let's get into the Word of God. Let's do a little bit of Bible study. Genesis chapter 13, verse 14 to 18. And after Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, Look as far as your eye can see in every direction, north and south, east and west. I am giving all this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. And I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth, they cannot be counted. Go and walk through the land in every direction, for I am giving it to you. So Abram, Abram moved his camp to Hebron and settled near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. There he built another altar to the Lord. There he built another altar to the Lord. Good evening, Henry Bridger. Good evening, my mother. It's good to have you online. Now, when we look at the life of Abraham, we got to go back one chapter to Genesis chapter 12. We read of how the Lord God, Jehovah, calls Abraham. And when he calls Abraham, it's very interesting to understand the context of when God called Abraham. When God calls Abraham, Abraham is living in a heathen nation, in fact, he is a heathen. You might say, wait a minute, I thought he was a Jew. Yes, he later became the father of the Jews. But when we first are introduced to Abraham, he comes from a heathen land, which would have been today in the country of Iraq. If he was alive today, his fatherland would have been Iraq. But God calls him from that land and it was from a city called the Ur of Shadaleans. And God calls him from this prosperous, innovative society. He calls him from that place and he speaks to him and he says these words in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. Leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those that bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the families on the earth will be blessed through you. Now that prophetically, that last part speaks about the Messiah that through the descendants of uh, Abraham, there would come the Messiah and all the families on the earth would be blessed through him. That would be the Messiah dying on the cross for all of mankind that we might receive salvation and redemption through the price that Jesus Christ would later pay on the cross. So this is God's plan of salvation where God is starting with one man called Abraham. And he calls him from a heathen place from the Ur of Shadaleans and God calls him to where? To a desert. In fact, God says to him, leave your fatherland and go to a land that I will show you. Now, God just speaks to Abraham out of nowhere. God talks to him and communicates with him and gives him these instructions to leave everything that he ever knew and every person that he ever knew. 
Now, we've got to also consider that Abraham didn't have a Bible or a church. He didn't have a pastor. There was no organized religion. It only came in at Exodus chapter 20. So, for somewhat 400 years before the law of Moses, God speaks to this heathen man that's staying in a heathen culture and civilization, calls him out of that civilization to go into a desert. Now, the Earl of Chatelians was the, like the New York City of its day. So to call Abraham out of that city to leave everything that he ever knew, that would have taken a great step of faith. But that's why Abraham is known as the father of faith. In fact, three major religions right now can trace their roots back to Abraham. Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And Abraham becomes not just a father of faith, but a model of faith. Somebody that's obedient to the voice of God. In fact, God says, I will bless you and I will make you not just a nation, but a great nation. The only condition was that Abraham had to be obedient to what God told him to do. In fact, listen to what was his response to God's calling in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. So Abraham departed as the Lord had instructed. So he did exactly what God said. And he moves, he takes the step of faith, and he goes into a wilderness. Now, just for uh, a thought, listen to this. Imagine if you were Sarah, his wife, and all of a sudden, Abraham comes to you and says to you, I've been praying, and Jehovah, God, has spoken to me, and he says we must leave all our relatives, we must leave everything we ever knew, and we must go into the desert. We must leave this city, and we must leave it and go into the desert into a dry place. And then Sarah says, okay, but where into the desert? And Abraham says, well, God said he will show me. There's no destination on his GPS. There is no indication of how far he would have to travel. God is just saying to him, leave everything and I will bless you. I will make you a great nation. I want you to consider that when God blesses you, he doesn't bless you small. He blesses you big. When God blesses you, he can exceed your expectations. God gives a promise unto Abraham. And he says unto Abraham, I will make you a great nation. In fact, your descendants will be blessed. And whoever blesses you will be blessed. And whoever curses you will be cursed. So God gives him the promise of a mighty nation will come out of him. And we know this would be Israel prophetically. But there's just one problem. Genesis chapter 11 verse 30. The Bible tells us that Sarah, his wife, was barren. In other words, she could not fall pregnant. Now, that was the doctor's report. That was the medical condition that she had. She could not physically fall pregnant. But I love the fact that God comes and speaks to Abraham about his destiny and not about his limitations. God speaks to him about having a nation while the condition of Sarah is she cannot fall pregnant. You see, God does not consult our limitations before he decides to give us a promise or bless us. All we have to do is not limit God by what man says or the conclusions that man makes, but to take God at his word and to step out in faith and to do what God has said. So Abraham obeys God. He does what God says. In fact, Jesus comes later in the Gospels in John chapter 14 verse 15 and he says these words. He says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. So in other words, your love for me will be measured by your obedience to me. You could say that you love God. Do you obey God? Are you obedient to God? Now, let's make it practical. What does it look like to obey God? Quite simply, you do what God says in his word. You do what God tells you to do. Abraham was obedient. He was obedient to God. Abraham was obedient to God and Jesus, like I said in John chapter 14 verse 15 said, you can measure 
your love by the, your obedience towards him. So, here is Abraham. He goes into a desert. And he comes into a certain land. And it's the land of Canaan. Now, Canaan, the land was named after a man, Canaan, who was the son of Ham, a descendant of Noah. If you remember correctly, if you go and study the life of Noah, Noah had three sons. He had Japheth, Shem, and Ham. Now, after the flood, it was Noah, his three sons, his wife, and his three daughter-in-laws. And from these three sons would come the nations of the earth. Now, Japheth is where the Europeans and the Asians would originate from. Shem is where the Muslims and the Israelites would originate from. And Ham is where the people of Canaan would originate from. Now, Ham was cursed by Noah. So, Ham is cursed. Canaan is cursed. The land of Canaan is cursed. And if you go do a study of the Canaanites, especially in the day of Abraham, you come to realize that they were a wicked people. In fact, when Abraham first comes into Canaan, it's a wicked nation. It is a wicked and evil nation. They're doing child sacrifices. They are doing things that are grievous in the sight of God. There's homosexuality. There are things that are not right in the eyes of God. Uh, men are just taking women as they desire to fulfill their sexual desires that they have. And in fact, we see a prime example of this in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, of how their sins reached up to heaven and God brought destruction upon them. This is what the land was like. I say all of this is because God calls Abraham out of a heathen place, okay, a godless place, to a wicked place, a place that's seemingly more wicked. And he calls him to this wicked place. And he says, there I will bless you. Now, we live in a nation, and I want to say this and listen to what I'm saying. We live in a nation that is not a nation under God. I'm not saying that we are not a people under God as a church, but the nation South Africa is not a Christian nation. A Christian nation is a nation that is submitted unto God. A Christian nation is not a nation that aborts its babies. It's not a nation that promotes um, sin that is a contradiction or that goes against the Bible. It's not a nation that promotes laws that you know, um, transgresses God's word. It's not a nation that does forefather um, worship. There are things happening in this nation that is a grievance unto the Lord. Prostitution, crime, murder, rape. These are all as a result of a root problem. We are not a Christian nation. We can become a Christian nation and we can trust God that revival can come and God can revive the church and that the world can be evangelized, the people can be evangelized, that the harvest can come in, that the leaders can begin to fully turn back to God, not just half-heartedly, but fully turn back to God and this can be a nation under God. But you and I as Christians, as born-again believers, we are called in this hour, in this nation this wicked nation to be just like abraham i'm going to show you in a minute i say that because so many times if you or so many times you can easily become discouraged by the circumstances in this nation and what's happening in this nation but if we look at the life of abraham we realize that yah was a man called and chosen by god who did not have the perfect background who did not have even a religion to go by. He was just a man that followed the voice of God. He was obedient unto God to the best of his ability, his ability. He did what God told him to do. And he followed the voice of God into a dry place, into a desert, into a wicked nation. And as he followed God into this wicked nation, as he went there, God began to bless him. 
in a ridiculous way. In fact, we see how God begins to prosper him and make him wealthy. Now, I want to tell you, in spite of what's happening in the economy, in spite of what's happening all around us, God can make us prosperous as his children. He wants us to be an example unto the world that he is a God that blesses his children, that he's a good God. I'm not saying that we serve God so that we can be prosperous. Prosperity is a byproduct of what it means to follow God. But how are we ever going to convince the world that God can provide, that God can heal, that God can deliver, if we are bound, broken, and defeated? How are we ever going to uh, testify to the world if we are walking around in poverty and we've got the sorry attitude? You know, as Christians, we should be going from glory to glory. Every single year, we need to be going up another level in our faith. We need to be trusting God more. We need to be, uh, you know what, we need to be surpassing what we achieved in the past when it comes to our faith and when it comes to our personal ministry. We need to be doing more and more for the kingdom and for the glory of God. We need to become a better uh, testimony for the glory of God. Every single one of us. Don't you want to be a great testimony for God? Don't you want to be a testimony for the glory of God? Good evening, John Dean. It's good to see you online. Martin Miller, it's good to have you online. Helene van der Westhuizen. God wants to make you and I a great testimony for His glory. Like Abraham. Abraham comes into Canaan. And as he comes into Canaan, now listen to this. He comes into this wicked and evil nation. As he comes there, what does he experience? A famine. A famine. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 12. And uh, verse. Let me quickly read it here. And verse 10. At the time a severe famine struck the land of Canaan. So yeah God calls him to this land. As he comes into this land. He has a famine. Now what's a famine? A famine is a drought. That has progressed. Into more difficult And terrible circumstances. And now it's a famine. You see a drought is when there's no rain. A drought becomes a national crisis. A famine is where there is now widespread hunger. As a result of there being no rain on the farm. So there are no harvests. And as a result of no harvest there are no food. And now there's widespread hunger and poverty. And the Bible says that he comes into the land that God showed him. And as he comes into the land, there is a famine. And not just a famine in any place, a famine in a desert, in a dry place, in a dry place. Now, you know what would be most Christians response to that today? Most Christians, most children of God. Well, let's not say most. Let's say some children of God. You know what their response would be? Oh, this is not working out. Following God, it's not worth it. I don't know, maybe God is punishing me. Why is this happening to me? This is so unfair. Have you ever considered that God, when He calls us, He does not call us to comfort. He does not call us to comfort comfortable circumstances. He calls us for His glory, but He also calls us to change. And He uses circumstances to bring forth His glory. You see... You could look at the problem and you could think this is an obstacle. This this is an obstacle to my destiny. This is an obstacle to my breakthrough. Or you could think of the problem not as an obstacle but as an opportunity for you to deepen your faith and to grow in God. To grow in Christ. You see, you've got to understand something. If you go to Genesis chapter 26, in the very next generation, Isaac is in the land. The Bible says a famine struck the land again in the land of Canaan. Now, Isaac is the heir to the promise. He is the promised child of Abraham. Now he's there. His father has passed on in the previous chapter, Genesis chapter 25. Isaac is now in the desert on his own. He's facing the same battle that his father faced. And God speaks to him in a divine way and says, do not, do not leave this land. Do not go down to Egypt. Why? Because that was the first response of anybody that was in Canaan when a famine would come. They would flee down to Egypt because Egypt was an oasis in the Middle East. That's where the Nile River was. 
So that would be the first response because a person would look for refuge in Egypt. In fact, that's what Abraham did and it cost him dearly. He didn't pray, he didn't ask God, but he moved down into Egypt for a time. But in the next generation, God says to Isaac specifically, stay in this land. In other words, stay in this famine, stay in these difficult circumstances and I will bless you. Just do what I say. You see, God did not deliver Isaac out of the famine. He blessed him in the midst of the famine. And God is not going to deliver you from every difficult circumstance. God is not going to deliver you from every famine, so to speak. But God will use it to bless you, to give you, to show you his goodness, to give you prosperity, to give you the breakthrough that you desire. All I and you have to do is we just have to be obedient to the voice of God. Just obey the voice of God. So the Bible says that Isaac stayed in the land and he sowed seed in the land. And Genesis chapter 26 verse 12 says he reaped a hundredfold in return what he sowed. A hundredfold in return. In other words, if he sowed one seed, then there was a hundred multiplication on that seed. If he sowed one seed for one tomato, he got a hundred tomatoes in its place. And in the midst of a famine, in the midst of wicked and evil people, Isaac becomes prosperous and God blesses him. Why? Because he was obedient to God and he stayed right where God told him. Do you know how many people are fleeing difficult circumstances without praying or consulting God? I know of so many people that have immigrated or relocated and I've got more testimonies about how it was a bad decision than it was a good decision. Because we are not praying all the time and asking God, God, is this what we are supposed to do? Can you confirm? Is this the direction we're supposed to move? Have you ever considered that where you are might be where God wants you to be? Maybe you're looking down to your Egypt, so to speak. You're looking down to that town or that city or that nation. And you think, you know what, if I could move there, then I would be blessed. Then things would work out. But what happens if God wants you to be right where you are because God wants to bless you right there where you are? What is your Canaan? What is that place? Maybe you're right there. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a town. Maybe it's a city. Maybe it's circumstances. Family circumstances and you are looking to run away and you're looking to flee and God is saying, no, 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 stay right where you are. Stay right where you are. I will bless you in the midst of all these difficult circumstances as God blessed Abraham. The Bible says as a result of the famine, here comes Abraham. He goes down to Egypt and then he's there in Egypt. There's a whole bunch of circumstances that occur in Egypt, which could have easily been avoided had Abraham first prayed. But that's a sermon for another day. But Genesis chapter 13 tells us this. He comes back right into the desert, into the land of Canaan. He comes straight back into the famine. And listen to what the Bible says. Listen to this. Genesis chapter 13 verse 2. Abraham was rich in livestock, silver and gold. Here is this man. He's got silver and gold in a dry place, in a famine. He's blessed in the desert. You see, when he came back to where God told him to go originally, all of a sudden silver and gold came into his hands. He was blessed. He was blessed. In fact, the Bible says that he became a very rich man. Now, there are a lot of people that don't like the fact that if you preach, you say that God wants to bless you in your wealth. Well, I want to tell you, it's a byproduct of serving God. There are scriptures upon scriptures where God will provide. And I'm not saying that God's going to give you worldly possessions so that you can feel good about yourself or that you can build your image or your status. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is God will provide for you in such a way that he will bless you to be a blessing. In fact, that's what God told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. In other words, you will be a blessing. You will be a blessing to the families of the earth. Just through you, you're going to be a blessing. When God blesses you, he doesn't just bless you for yourself. He blesses you to be a blessing. Anarita Fori, that's right. Through challenges come growth. Good evening, Andre Loschberg. Lisa Kreer, we just prayed for your nephew. God bless you. Beverly, good night. Good evening. Not good night. 
<laughs> Leonie Loesbech, welcome. Tasha the Toy, welcome. So, yeah, Abraham has got gold and silver in a desert. In a desert, in his hands. Where did it start? Obedience to God. Obeying God. The Bible says he had much livestock. Now, that gives us an indication of how he became rich. The Bible says that he was a livestock farmer. So in a time where people stayed in tents and we had a time where people used animal skins for clothes, for bags, for other accessories, Abraham had much livestock. So he could then sell the livestock as food and for materials, for tents and clothes. And as a result of having a lot of livestock in his day, livestock was a measure of wealth. He became rich and wealthy and silver and gold came into his hands in the middle of a wicked nation. In the middle of a wicked nation. That's right, Henry Bridger. Faith is a doing word. Faith, you, you gotta, you gotta do something. Faith without works is dead. Abraham did what God said. He did what God said. Now, I want to quickly read to you a couple of scriptures. Listen to the Psalm 37 verse 25. Just, just think about this as well. Genesis chapter 14 verse 14. Abraham is so blessed in the midst of this wicked nation that he goes to war with five other armies. He's got a small military of about 318 men. This man goes into Canaan, becomes rich and prosperous, has silver and gold, is a livestock farmer. He is so blessed... That he's even got a small military operating in this wicked nation. Psalm 37 verse 25. I have not seen the righteous forsaken. Nor his descendants begging for bread. The psalmist is telling us. That he's never seen the righteous forsaken. Now who's the righteous? Anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord. Are you a child of God? Then you are righteous. You are righteous. John Dean, you're right. God has got a plan for all of us. And he says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. Those who call upon the name of the Lord, in other words. Nor have I seen his descendants begging for bread. You know, as children of God, we, we're not called to be beggars. We are called to be kings. We are called to rule and reign. You and I, we are called to rule and reign. I believe it's Romans chapter 5 verse 17 that says, um, let me just look for the scripture. Romans chapter 5 verse 17 says, we will rule and reign in this life. In this life. Not in the next life, in this life, right here on earth. For by one man's offense, death reigned through one. Much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign through in life through the one Jesus Christ. So you and I have been called to rule and reign over our circumstances. In fact, that was one of the first commands that God gave man. He said, be fruitful and multiply and rule and reign over the earth. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 right down to verse 30. Rule and reign. Take dominion. You and I, we were made to rule and reign. That's why we've got such, um, we've got this uh, repulsiveness to being in bondage, to being in slavery, to being dominated. We don't like it. We resist it. Why? Because we weren't created to be dominated by the circumstances of life. We weren't created to be dominated by man. We weren't created to be put into slavery. We weren't created for it. It's not in your DNA. In your DNA is to rule and reign. And every single one of us have got a sphere to rule and reign. You have been called to rule and reign in a certain area according to your calling. So you're not called to beg. According to this scripture, and if I read it correctly, if we are truly righteous in the eyes of God, we will never beg. We will never stand like we say in Afrikaans, bakant. We will never stand bakant. My mother, you're right. Be obedient to God and we will be blessed. That's the key. Just obedience to God. That's it. It's like, it's almost like cheating in an exam. I know God does not cheat and God um, 
God is holy, he's just, but it's almost unfair. It's an unfair advantage. Just obey God and you'll be blessed. 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 But, you know, the key is you've got to obey God. And obeying God is by walking by faith, listening to what he says, standing upon his promises, not looking to the circumstances. Abraham could have so easily looked at the famine and concluded that God is punishing him. God is against him. God is not helping him. He didn't throw up his hands in the air and say, oh, look at what's happening to me now. I was trusting God. Now I'm suffering. Now I'm in this famine. Let me try and go back to the Ur of Shadalians. No, he prospered right there because God called him there. Listen to what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 21. I love this scripture. Listen to this. Trouble chases sinners while blessings reward the righteous. Wow. I want you to type this comment right now. Say, blessings are chasing me. Blessings are chasing me. Now, trouble chases sinners while blessings reward the righteous. But it We've got to also take in, we've got to keep in mind that um, like Abraham, we can still go through difficult circumstances, but it's in the midst of difficult circumstances that blessings can chase us down, that God will reward us with blessings. But trouble in this sense is trouble that's outside of the will of God. Don't you want blessings chasing you? Just follow God. Just step out in faith. Just be obedient to what God is saying. Blessings are chasing me. Blessings are chasing me. I, me, a child of God. Blessings are chasing me. Psalm 84 verse 11. Listen to this. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows grace and favor and honor. Wow, awesome. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. In other words, when you do what's right and your heart is pure towards God, he becomes a sun and a shield to you. And the Lord bestows grace and favor and honor upon you. And he will withhold no good thing from you. He will withhold no good thing from you. All you have to do is just walk uprightly before the Lord. I'm not saying you've got to be perfect. But what I've got to say is your motives, your the, the um, intentions of your heart need to be pure before God. And guess what? He will withhold no good thing from you. Do you know there's a place where you can come in your walk with God where you don't have to pray all the time for blessings? Just by walking uprightly before the Lord, you will be blessed. Do you know Jesus says, even before you pray, I know exactly what you need. I know exactly what you need. God knows what you need right now. He knows the breakthrough that you desire. He knows exactly what you need. And he's a good God and he will withhold no good thing from you if you just trust him. If you just walk uprightly before him. Abraham walked uprightly before God. And God blessed him. The second thing he experiences in Canaan. Is conflict. And not just with anybody. With family. He takes Lot in after Lot had lost his father. Haran. And he takes his nephew Lot in. He looks after him. He trains him up to become a sheep farmer. Him and Lot they are sheep farmers in Canaan. They become so blessed that the Bible says in Genesis chapter 13 that the land could not contain both of them. They were so blessed. Think about that. So blessed. And as a result of the blessing, Genesis chapter 13 verse 6 to 9, there comes conflict in family. So yeah, he is. He's experiencing a famine on the one side. So he's got external pressure, external tension. And now there's internal pressure, internal tension within his home, within his family. Because the Bible says that his shepherds and Lot's shepherds began to fight. And Abraham realized that this is a potential for conflict between him and his nephew. So Abraham goes to Lot and he says to him, listen, we don't have to fight. I want to give you the choice. Whatever part of the land you want, you can have. Now, this is the older coming to the younger, which was actually against the culture of its day. 
The younger had to submit to the older. But here comes this uncle, this patriarch of the family. He speaks to his nephew. He says to him, listen, you can take whichever land you want. I'm willing to give you the advantage. And I'm willing to be disadvantaged. But I believe that Abraham had that attitude because he knew that God was with him. No matter where he went, God would bless him. And you see, the land was divided up in two. There was luscious plains. There was an oasis in the middle of Canaan, a beautiful uh, place that was well watered. And then there was this dry wilderness. And Lot selfishly picks the best piece of the land for himself. And in doing so, he leaves his uncle with a dry piece of land, with thorns and thistles, snakes and scorpions, dust and stones. And selfishly, he picks what's best for him. But when he picked it, he also picked Sodom. Because the Bible says, in that plain was Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of sin. So Lot doesn't pray. He doesn't seek God. He chooses selfishly what is best for him. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 13, verse 12, he comes near the city of Sodom. And there he sets up his tent towards the city of Sodom in the King James Version. In other words, his focus is in the direction of Sodom, the city of sin. He's looking towards sin. And he focused in that direction. And I want to tell you, wherever your focus, wherever what direction you focus to, that's the direction you'll move. You will always move in the direction of your focus. If you could show me what you focused on, if you could show me what you look at constantly on your phone, what you constantly visualize, I can tell you and predict to you accurately what's your future. He focused on Sodom. And Abraham then turns around after his nephew goes and takes the best part of the land. And when he looks at the land that's left over for him, which is a wilderness, which is a desert, there he sees this desert and God speaks to him in Genesis chapter 13 verse 14. And he says to him, and I read it just now. The Lord said to Abraham, look as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west. I'm giving you all this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants. It will be a permanent possession. In other words, I'm going to bless you in a desert. I'm going to bless you in the midst of a desert. That's right. Our focus must be on God. Amen. Abraham was focused on God while Lot was focused on himself. He was focused on himself. And as a result of being focused on himself and making decisions according to what he felt was best without even consulting God, without even praying about it, it later on brought terrible repercussions not just for himself but his whole family and if you study the life of lot you will come to understand that him and his family suffered dearly for the decision he made to move in the direction of sodom but what does what does abraham do after he separates from lot the bible says in verse 18 so abraham moved his camp to hebron and settled near the oak grove belonging to mamre and there he built another altar to the lord he builds an altar to the lord he builds a place of sacrifice a place of worship whenever you read of altar in the book of genesis it is symbolic of worship it's symbolic of sacrifice you see we don't necessarily understand what it means to worship worship is when we glorify god but worship is more than that. That's when we sacrifice ourselves where he can increase and we decrease. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. He tells us, Paul, the apostle Paul tells us that we must be the living sacrifice. Like in the Old Testament where the great patriarchs and the heroes of faith and the priests would take animals and sacrifice it on an altar to God. So it became a sweet smelling aroma as they burnt those sacrifices. Paul comes and he switches it around and he says, okay, in the Old Testament, the animal was the sacrifice. And that was symbolic of worship, the people's worship. But now in the New Testament, you are the sacrifice. Now, I'm not saying you've got to literally go climb on an altar and bry yourself, set yourself ablaze to prove that you're worshiping God. But what I am telling is you're going to have to sacrifice your will, your, uh, your agenda so that you can take up upon God's agenda so that you can prove that you are a true worshiper, that you worship him. 
He builds an altar unto the Lord. In fact, when he first comes into the land of Canaan, the Bible says, there, verse 7, God appears unto Abraham and gives him a promise that he will give this land to him and his descendants. And there Abraham builds an altar to the Lord. So the first thing he does in Canaan, he builds an altar unto the Lord. He worships God. You want to be blessed? Become a worshiper. You want God to move in your life? You want God to give you promises, prophetic insight? Start by worshiping God. Become the living sacrifice. It's not about you. It's all about God. The quickest way to reveal the heart of a person, whether they are, it's about them or it's about God, is let them go through a little bit of conflict. When you go through tension, if you're constantly having to prove yourself, having to have the last say, you've got to constantly, you know, get the last word in. You're going to show that person. Well, let me tell you something. You're not a living sacrifice. But when you get to a place where you say, you know what? God is in control. I'm leaving it to God. I will go lay down and I'll let God defend me. That's where you prove, hey man, I've become a living sacrifice unto God. It's not about me. It's all about God. But I love what God said to Abraham. He says these words. He says to him, look as far as you can see in every direction, north, south, east and west. God says to Abraham, look as far as you can see. How far can you see? I want to ask you as a child of God, how far can you see? How far can you see? Because you will never go beyond what you can see. You will never achieve what you cannot see. If you cannot see yourself as being blessed, you will never be blessed. If you cannot see yourself receiving promotion, you will never receive promotion. If you cannot see yourself as a good mother, guess what? You'll constantly feel as a failure as a mother. If you do not see yourself as a good father, you'll constantly feel like a failure as a father. If you do not see yourself as a child of God washed in the blood of Jesus, you've got destiny. You've been called. In fact, we've all been called as seed of Abraham. We have been called to be the seed of Abraham. We are the descendants of Abraham. In fact, I want to get a scripture for you to prove that to you. Where the Bible says in the book of Galatians, I believe it's Galatians chapter 3. We are called to be the seed of Abraham. Galatians chapter 3 verse 29. We are the seed of Abraham. We are his descendants. Abraham was blessed and his descendants. So if you are a child of God and you've given your heart to Jesus, you are a part of the lineage of Abraham. It's in your faith bloodline. You've got that inheritance. So you are blessed. If Abraham was blessed, all the blessings that Abraham had, you've got. I've got. But we've got to see it. Can you see yourself being blessed in the middle of a wilderness? Can you see yourself as a blessing unto others? Can you see yourself as a source of inspiration? A well of joy? Can you see yourself inspiring others, motivating others to come up higher? You will never go beyond what you can see. In fact, there's some people, they just see the negative, And then there's people that just see the positive. We've got examples throughout the Bible of people that what they saw led to their downfall. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. Eve saw the fruit and she saw that it was pleasing to the eye and desirable to eat. And she took thereof and she ate. And so came the fall of man when Adam ate after she had eaten. In Joshua chapter 6 verse 18 to 19, the people confronted, the people of Israel confronted Achan and said, why did you sin against the Lord? And he says, I saw the silver and the gold and the clothes and I took it and I hid it in my tent. He saw. Judges chapter 16 verse 1, Samson went to Gaza and he saw a prostitute and he spent the night with her. 2 Samuel chapter 11 verse 4, David was in Jerusalem on the top of his palace and he saw Bathsheba taking a bath. You see, there are some people, what they see brings their downfall. Lot saw the city of Sodom and he moved in that direction. Your focus is critical to your success. But then we've got good examples throughout the Bible. Matthew chapter 2 verse 10. The wise men saw the star which pointed them to the Messiah and they received great joy. Revelation chapter 22 verse 8. John on the island of Patmos received revelation the whole book of revelation because he saw everything that took that were that's still going to take place prophetically so to speak 
Genesis chapter 24 verse 64. This is one for all the single women out there. Rebecca saw her husband, her future husband Isaac. She saw him. Matthew chapter 14 verse 14. Jesus looked upon the multitudes and he felt compassion for them. And he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. He, while other people were seeing people that were a disturbance, Jesus saw an opportunity to minister unto them. Mark chapter 3 verse 11. Even the devils in the gospel recognized Jesus as the son of God. While the Pharisees saw him as a heretic. These people in the Gospels, they were completely divided about, about Jesus. There were those that saw a heretic. There were those that saw the Messiah. They saw the same man, but had different opinions. Genesis chapter 1 verse 4. The Bible says that God created light. When he created light, he saw that it was good. In fact, everything that God created in Genesis chapter 1, throughout the story of creation, he kept looking and seeing that it's good. You see, when you've got the eyes of God, you see the goodness of God. You see things that are good. You see things that are good in spite of difficult circumstances. In spite of circumstances that come against you. What are you seeing? What are we seeing in our nation? Are we seeing a revolution that's going to take place in the future? Or are we seeing revival that's coming? What do you see when you look at the church? Do you see a group of hypocrites? Or do you see the bride of Christ? People that aren't perfect but are washed in the blood of Jesus. What do you see when you look at the Bible? When you look at the Bible, when you think about the Bible, do you see a book of restrictions or do you see a book of promises? What do you do when you look at your loved ones? Do you see people that have offended you, made you angry, have hurt you? Or do you see an opportunity to express love, compassion and, and to nurture and to protect what do you see? God said to Abraham, look as far as you can see. As far as you can see. Many people would have seen a wilderness. They would have seen a, des a desert. But Abraham saw a land flowing with milk and honey. And right there he builds an altar unto the God. Isn't it amazing that Lot falls into the city of sin. He comes into the city of sin. Later it pollutes him and his family. The sin that's taking place in Sodom. But Abraham immediately connects with God. Builds an altar unto the Lord. And God blesses him there. I would rather have God in a desert. Than have no God. Or let me say it like this. Have the devil in paradise. Did you know you could be living a nightmare in paradise. Because God is not with you. We've all got to strive and focus on God. To make sure we are blessed. Do you want to be blessed in the middle of your difficult circumstances? you want breakthrough to come? Do you want to be a walking breakthrough for other people? It starts by putting your focus on God. What do you see? What do you see? That's right. We need spiritual eyes and ears. In fact, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 to 19. Paul prays a prayer for spiritual wisdom for the Ephesian church. And listen to what he says. He says these words encouraging them that he's praying for them. He prays that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? In other words, God, Paul is saying, I would want to enlighten your eyes. I want you to see the riches you have in God. I want to see the I want you to see the wealth you have in God. I want you to see the power of God in your life, how it can manifest in your life. Does it sound like Paul is talking about broke, defeated, and overwhelmed Christians? No, he's talking about victorious Christians, wealthy and blessed Christians, Christians that are wealthy from the inside, prospering in all that they do. And he says, where it's got to start is with your eyes. I pray that your eyes will be enlightened, that your eyes will open. I want to pray for you tonight that God would open your eyes, that you will see what God has in store for you, that you will not be limited by your circumstances, but that you will walk in the unlimited blessing and prosperity of God. So right there where you are, I want to pray for you right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I want to pray for every person that is watching, that you would enlighten the eyes to see 
and to receive understanding that they may know what is the hope of your calling and what are the riches of the glory for your inheritance that you have for every single child of God that is listening and watching right now. I pray, Lord Father God, reveal your power unto us, reveal your plan unto us, reveal your purpose unto us, lead us and direct our steps that even in difficult and dry circumstances, even in our Canaan, so to speak, that we will be prosperous and blessed. Why? Because we serve a God that is unlimited, a God that is not limited by this economy, a God that is not limited by what's taking place in Parliament, a God that is not limited by storms, trials and tribulations, but a God that is unlimited. I pray right now, Lord, use us, Lord Father God, to be kings and priests on this earth. Lord, help us to rule and reign over our circumstances. I pray, Lord Father God, strengthen every person's faith that is watching right now. We give you all the glory and honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If you've listened to this word and you say, Pastor, I want to receive Jesus into my heart. I want to make sure that my, uh, that my life is right with God. Would you pray this prayer with me? It's just where you pray and you say, Jesus, come into my heart. I give you my life. You know, when you do that, the Bible says, according to Romans chapter 10, verse 9, you experience salvation. Salvation is through Jesus is what gives us the guarantee that we will spend eternity with him. You know, life offers us many choices, but eternity only offers us two choices, heaven and hell. And I want to tell you, my brother, my sister, it is God's desire that all should be saved and come to the knowledge of Christ. So right there where you are, wouldn't you want to just pray and just say, Dear Lord Jesus, just say, Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I give you my life. I surrender my life to you. I admit and acknowledge that you died on the cross and that you rose from the grave. I confess you, Jesus, as king. I admit that I'm a sinner. And I admit I need a savior. Jesus I make you my savior. I give you my life. I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. If you pray that simple prayer. I believe you've received the gift of salvation. Get into a good Bible based church. Keep God first place. Spend time reading the Bible, praying on a daily basis. Start with 20 minutes a day. Let your faith grow. And as your faith begins to grow, you will see the hand of God. It doesn't mean that you won't experience problems. It doesn't mean you won't experience difficult circumstances. But you will be blessed in the desert. You will be blessed like Abraham was blessed. All you've got to do is keep your eyes on God. Keep your focus on God. i leave you with that tonight. May God richly bless you. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. Now I want to quickly greet everybody that's online. So if you're going to go offline, God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Remember, I'll be live next um, next Saturday at 8 o'clock. Henry Bridger, it's good to have you online. God bless you. Willem Rabi, it's always good to have you online, Willem. Rene Stofberg, God bless you. It's good to have you, Rene. Cindy Stradom, welcome. It was good to have you and John Dean in church last Sunday. Marie Wilder. Welcome. Anneli Fasahi, welcome. Tasha de Toy, welcome. Beverly, it's good to have you. Madre Potiche, welcome. Anna Rita Fori, God bless you. Elise Janssen van Vieren, Schoenmark, God bless you. Amen. Pastor Yolanda van Vieren, it's good to have you online. And my own mother, Suzette Silberman, it's good to have you online. Marty Miller, God bless you. It's good to have you online. Well, that's all that I have for tonight. Thank you to all of you that take the time to click a like, share, and to comment. I appreciate every one of you. Lisa Kriya, God bless you. Amen. Well, thank you to all of you that take the time to comment, like, and share. I appreciate it. Blessings to all of you. May you have a good day tomorrow. May it be a blessed Sunday. And may you experience God's goodness in all that you do in this week to come. This is Pastor Dominic. I'm signing out.